fall out. Uh, but I see some of you have heard it, so I won't tell it. So let me ask you to do this. Let's stand together while I read a passage, offer a short prayer, and we'll get into some things very, very serious. From 2 Corinthians chapter 2, these words. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. And through us spreads everywhere the fragrance of the knowledge of him. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are the smell of death. To the other the fragrance of life. And who is equal to such a task? Let's pray. Father, we bow before you this morning as your gathered people, your church, your ecclesia, your chosen ones, here to honor you and to praise you in all that we do and say and think. Father, we pray that for the next few minutes we will open your words and be honest with them, that we will allow them to infiltrate our hearts, our minds, our actions, and our speech. And we pray, Father, that it does make a difference in our lives. And so we ask that you be with us this morning as we share some thoughts with each other. It's our prayer through Christ. Amen. Be seated. One Sunday morning several years ago, I had decided to change colognes. I didn't tell anybody, I didn't tell my wife, I just changed colognes. To this day, I don't remember what it was. It may have been something good, it may have been something bad. I do not remember, I just know I changed it. And I went to the congregation that morning, prepared to preach. I walked into the auditorium and I ran into a gentleman by the name of Green. So Bob Green and I had a conversation and Bob had with him his, I don't know, eight or nine year old grandson. And uh, I said, Bob, how are you? And I shook his hand and he said, Wayne, I'm fine. I want you to meet my grandson. Uh, Bobby, this is Wayne. And so Bobby said, how are you, Mr. What is that smell? <laughs> and I thought that was a pretty good question. Now we get into the habit sometimes of asking each other silly questions. I have a, a man I know who went into a library, sat down on a chair, not noticing that he was sitting on the newspaper, and somebody walks in and says, are you reading that? Now that's a silly question. <laughs> I was standing in the back of an auditorium one day and a gentleman came out. Some of you will know him, I think. His name is Art. And I said, Art, how are you? He said, is that a serious question or are you just being polite? That's a, that's a good question. We, we ask each other good questions. We, we ask each other bad questions. We are in a society of, of questions. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, in the context that we are not involved in right now, but in the context of the return of the Lord where things are going to be destroyed and the earth is going to disappear and things are going to go away, Peter asks in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 11, what kind of people ought we to be? That's a great question. And I think Paul in this passage in 2 Corinthians answers that question. We are to be people with an aroma. We are to be people with a fragrance. We are to be people with a smell of sorts. Now we're not talking about the smell that you have if you don't take a shower or a bath. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about the, the idea that we are to be certain kinds of people. Now, Paul, uh, Peter asked that question in the context of the Lord's coming. Let's take the context away. Now, the Lord is coming. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying let's take that question out of that context and put it into our own. What happens when we put that context in our own uh, society, in our own culture? Can we ask the same question? In this culture we are in, where the world is changing exponentially, can we ask that question? What kind of people ought we to be? Now, I think it's a great question because we are in a culture that's changing rapidly. Let me give you an illustration or two. 
I don't know if you sit around thinking about math. Most po folks don't. But I read something recently that said that experts had decided that we had reached our first billion people in this world around 1830. We reached our second billion in 1930. We reached our third billion in 1960. Do you see a pattern here? We reached our fourth billion in 1975. We are now at seven point something billion people in this world. You see how fast that's escalating? That's exactly what's happening in our world. The question is still, what kind of people ought we to be? There's nothing in that question that says because the culture is different, because the culture is changing, because the culture is not what you want, we need to be something else. No ma'am, no sir. What kind of people ought we to be? I just started looking recently at our culture. I, I mean, yeah, every day, every day there's enough information to fill eight sets of 24 volume encyclopedias. Every day. But now it's changing so much that we don't even have those encyclopedias anymore, do we? People aren't going door to door to selling those encyclopedias. I'm on the board, as has been mentioned, of your college. We're doing away with books. We're getting into the, the, the computer age where we're, we're putting everything on computer. I was going to, when I retired, give all my books to your college. Uh, they don't want them. Do you want them? <laughs> I got to do something with them. You know, they're, 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 they're weighing my house down. I have a lot of books. I looked back and in the first computer I got, I was told this computer is the only computer you'll ever need. How much power, in fact, the guy told me, he said, there's as much power on this computer that, that more than it took to get Sputnik up. For you young people, look up Sputnik. And I thought, wow, that's a lot of power. How much, how much power is it? He said, one gig. How much does yours have? A king, 300 years ago, with this kind of power, could have ruled the world, not his small province. I, I look at culture, and we're changing. Young people today are studying for jobs that don't even exist. Young people today are going to classes, and they're not going to teachers anymore. They're not going to the sage on the stage. They're going to the guide on the side. They're reading their own books on their computer. We're just changing. Uh, when I was a kid, Dick Tracy was popular. You know what he had? Had a watch that he could check in on. I thought, wow, wouldn't that be neat? Some of you in this audience are probably wearing one of those. That's how fast we're changing. The question is still, what kind of people ought we to be? Are we to be different? Are, are we, what's our aroma supposed to be when you walk outside this building? And people see you go to the grocery store or people see you driving. Some of you need driving lessons. <laughs> heard about a cop one time that said he pulled over a lady for, <laughs> for making obscene gestures. But he saw on the bumper sticker the I love Jesus or honk if you love Jesus or peace sign and the fish and all that kind of stuff. And, he said, I'm sorry, I thought the car was stolen. <laughs> Think about that one. What's your example when you go out and drive? What's your example when you go to the store? What's your example when you go to the restaurant? What's your example when you go to school? What kind of people ought we to be? Now, if the world is changing, I'm going to suggest we need to do the same. Now, be careful. Stop right there now that I have your attention. I'm not asking for the church to change theology. I'm not asking for the church to change what it's teaching. Uh, I, I don't like change any more than you do. You notice this morning you don't have a PowerPoint. There's a reason for that. I don't like PowerPoints. I don't like selfies. I took one and made me look like a criminal. I've not taken another one. I just don't like them. But we need to change, and I'm not talking about our teaching, I'm not talking about anything except how we reach people. It used to be that we went out to meet people where they were. Then we decided, well, let's just bring them to church. And so we empty the back pews and say, we're going to let the millennials sit back there when they come in, make them welcome. No, 
It's not happening that way anymore. The responsibility is now no longer for your preacher. It is now no longer bringing the folks here, at least not first. We've got to do a better job outside these walls and we've got to change our attitude to think in terms of what your responsibility is, what's my responsibility toward the world outside before you ever get them inside. You're not going to get them inside if you have a foul odor, the fragrance of death out there. I don't know, brethren. We are saved people, aren't we? We are people who have the grace of God. We have the Spirit living in us. And we have a sense of peace over the past. We have a sense of peace over the present. We have a sense of peace over the future. And we have a hard time acting like it out there. Why? What is our fragrance? You are the fragrance of God. Paul says we are the aroma of Christ. Now this is not a new idea. When you go back to Genesis chapter 8, Noah gets off the, the boat of his. And what does he do? He has a sacrifice that's a sweet smelling savor to God. You look back at Leviticus chapters 1, 2, and 3. In Ukraine, I teach the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. The first three sacrifices, even though there was a sacrifice involved and bloodletting involved, it was a sweet-smelling aroma to Christ. God wants that aroma. Now, when I look at the New Testament, we don't have something like that in the New Testament. We don't go out and sacrifice lambs. We have a, we have a sacrificial lamb in Jesus Christ who gave himself on the cross five, uh, 2,000 years ago. That takes care of that once for all, as has been mentioned already this morning. The only other sacrifice I find in the New Testament is Romans chapters 12, verse 1, 2, and 3, where you are to present yourselves as living sacrifices to God. The problem with living sacrifices is we tend to want to crawl off the altar. Your job as a sacrifice, a living sacrifice of Christ is to have that aroma of Christ that attracts people to you and therefore attracts people to Jesus Christ. You are not the center, for, uh, the center of your universe. He is. And so what is our aroma? What is our smell? Well, let's look first of all at Acts chapter 2. Let's look at Acts chapter 2 for just a second. Verse 42 and following. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer, and everyone was filled with awe. The many wonders and miraculous signs that were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and held everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those that were being saved. That's what they did. But is there anything beyond that? Because you see... You could do all of that and have a bad aroma. There have been people in the church I have met that did all of that, but their aroma was not good. They had a bitter attitude, or they were criticizing all the time, or they were judging all the time, or they had all kinds of problems that way. What is our attitude when someone says the landmark Church of Christ, what comes to their mind? Or perhaps when they put your name in that slot, what comes to their mind? You see, I look at Isaiah chapter 1, and I find words like this. Stop bringing meaningless offerings. Your incense is detestable to me. New moons, Sabbaths, convocations, I cannot bear your evil assemblies. Your new moon festivals and your appointed feast, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands in prayer, I will hide my eyes from you. Even if you offer many prayers, I will not listen. Take your evil deeds out of my sight and stop doing wrong. Who's saying that? God is saying that. To whom is he saying it? He's saying it to his own people. What have they done? Their fragrance had gone out. Oh, they were doing the right things. They were sacrificing and they were celebrating the festivals. Their heart wasn't in it. 
their attitude was very simply wrong. And you can find those comments in Amos and Micah and other places as well. So please understand that when you do those things and you come to church on Sunday mornings, it's not a box to check off. You're doing it to refuel yourself, refill yourself so that you can go outside these walls and do something of, with your, your fragrance and your, your odor, if you will, your smell, that people will be attracted to who you are and whose you are. And I find that very, very important. So let me give you very quickly, hopefully, I was told I could go as long as I wanted, but you guys leave about 1130. <laughs> Let me give you some basic priorities to make your smell better. And please, these are my thoughts from my text. And if I say something wrong that you don't agree with, I'll be here as long as you have questions. Number one, I am converted to Jesus Christ, not the church. Think seriously. I've been added to the church. I have spent my life with the church. I am committed to the church. I am converted to Jesus Christ. You and I need to be thinking in terms of being converted to him. I have never been converted to any congregation I've worked for. I have never been converted to the elders of such. I have never been converted to the people I work with. They are with me in the body as we are converted to Jesus Christ. John 12, 20 and 21, where the people very simply took the apostles aside and said, we would see Jesus. When people look at you, they don't want to see you if you're doing what you need to do. They're looking for Jesus. We would see Jesus. 1 John 3, 2 and 3. In this world, the writer says, we are to be like him. We are like him. Acts chapter 2, verse 36, as Peter's preaching that first sermon. And he says, this Jesus, whom you crucified, is both Lord and Christ. Now, we don't mind him being Christ, because he's the one that saves us. But along with that, he is also Lord. He is the Lord of your life. He is the one that controls your life. He is the one that sets the attitude of your life. If indeed, in fact, it is the one who sets the smell of your life. You are to be like him. Look at John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Jesus speaking says you diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. I, that applies to me over many years. You think about studying the scriptures. I want us to study the scriptures. I want us to do it diligently. I want us to do it seriously. But then he says these are the scriptures that testify about me yet you refuse to come to me for life. Who's speaking? Jesus Christ. I first am converted to Jesus Christ. He is the one. I want him to set my life tone. I want him to be my example. I want him to be the one who shines through whatever I do, whatever I say, wherever I go, wherever I find myself. I'm converted to Jesus Christ. Number two. You want your smell to be well and done well? Find yourself a place of service. Find yourself a real place of service. I, I, I am too long in this world to know that we're anything but selfish. We are a self-centered culture. Um, it, I, I was at a seminar yesterday that went all the way back to Egypt and said that the Egyptian culture was all about the eyes. And it, as an illustration, they showed all the pictures and all the pharaohs and all that, and they had huge eyes and everything was painted on the eye. It was huge. They were about the eyes, not, not about the heart, not about the mind, all about the eyes. We are about the eyes. We're looking for ourselves. I, I like myself better than anybody else. I want to dress myself better than anybody else. I want myself to have good food. I want myself to have good retirement. I want myself to have this. I want myself to have better shoes. I want myself to have a better watch. I want myself to have a better suit and a better tie, a better shirt. Where does it end, brethren? 
find yourself a place of servant, you, service. You are not here just to take care of yourself. Who are you taking care of outside of yourself? Be different someplace, but find a place to serve. Question. Here's a, here's a statement from a book. Charles Swindoll. Lord, you know how I serve you with great emotional favor and in the limelight. You know how I eagerly speak for you at the women's club. You know how I effervesce when I promote a fellowship group. You know my genuine enthusiasm at a Bible study. But how would I react, I wonder, if you pointed to a basin of water and asked me to wash the calloused feet of a bent and wrinkled old woman day after day, month after month, in a room where nobody saw and nobody knew. Service. What do you do to serve? Oh, I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about doing what you want to do. I really am not. When we get to the point of understanding that we are to serve where God wants us to serve, they will be making some difference. I, I used to work with a lady, Betty Erickson is her name. She had polio as a young girl. Uh, she got over it, she thought. She got past it. And then by 21, 22, she received it back again. They put her in an iron lung, which is where she slept every night. During the daytime, we had to get her out, put her in the bed. She couldn't breathe on her own. She had a machine she put in her mouth, helped her breathe. She had to eat between breaths. She had to talk between breaths. What is she going to do? She said, I got to serve somebody. She could move her feet just a little bit. Move her feet just a little bit. And somebody installed a dial tone. You remember what those were? <laughs> little dial tone down here for a telephone. There was a phone on a stick. She had one toe, could dial the number. Another toe could push a button to bring that phone down by her ear. And after we put her in bed every morning, she called people all day long asking how they were. And you tell me you can't serve, and I tell you I can't serve. There's something wrong there. If we are people of service, brethren, that's our smell. That's our, our, our attitude. That's where we make a difference. And if we're willing to serve, can I tell you that if you're willing to serve, there's nothing beneath your dignity. If my Lord can get on his knees and wash the dirty feet of 12 of his apostles because none of the others wanted to do it. First of all, I find that we should have one Lord and 12 servants, but we had one servant and 12 lords. And one servant got on his knees and washed dirty feet. And then he gave me the instruction, and I believe he gave you the instruction if it's in your Bible. By this shall all men know that you're my disciple. If you love one another, you do this. You wash feet. Of course he's not talking literal feet. But you find yourself in a position where you can serve somebody else and don't ask what your reward's going to be. It's a place of service. It's something we do because we are his. So we're converted to Christ. First of all, we find a place of service. Secondly, thirdly, and this is becoming harder. We need to become people of grace, a church of grace. Now, I've got to tell you right up front, every time I preached a sermon on grace, someone would come to me and say, now, don't forget works. But if I ever preached a sermon on works, no one ever came to say, don't forget grace. I don't know why it's been such a fear factor for us. Grace and works work together. If you've got grace, you've got works. And if you've got that relationship, read James chapter 2 and 3 and find out about grace and works. But you've got to be a person of grace. 2 Timothy 2, 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Grace. It's just being pronounced not guilty. 
God can do that for you. He does that for others. But see, here's our problem. Look at Romans chapter 3. There is no one righteous, Paul writes. Not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. All have turned away and have be together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursings and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, run, ruin, and misery. Mark their ways in the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God in their eyes. Does that describe today? Um, can I tell you it describes us as well? That's us without the grace of God. That's us without his mercy. That's us without what he has offered to us. And yet to us he's offered salvation. To us he's offered justification. To us he's offered cleansing and fellowship. He's done that for us. Are we not willing to do that for somebody else? Philip Yancey in one of his books said, Why go to church? I feel bad enough already. Is that what we do when people come in? We make them feel worse? This isn't a worse place. This is a praise place. This is a grace place. This is a love place. Now, I'm not asking you to appreciate what's wrong. I'm not asking you to appreciate what people do in vile ways. But can I remind you that Jesus Christ even loved those that we somehow turn our backs against? Jesus Christ didn't approve of what they did, and yet he loved them. It's amazing to me. Jesus Christ was as tough on anybody who did sin as anybody else, and yet people longed to be in his presence. Why? <coughs> well, first of all, they knew he was right. But secondly, al along with his rightness, he sat with sinners. He sat with those whose ideas were different than his. He sat with those who were publicans and prostitutes and people who don't have ideas like his or ours. Paul, I look at Paul. Paul was a legalistic Pharisee. He was as legalistic as he could be. And yet Paul and the Pharisees were stopped in their tracks by grace. Now, when I say grace, I'm not talking about grace free of holiness. I'm not talking about grace that allows you to do as you please. I'm not talking about grace that, that, that allows you to be whatever you want to be, and then somehow, Lord, I'm sorry, and everything's okay. But we need to be people of grace, people who have, are willing to share what has been shared with us. The idea that we can be different based on the grace of and the love of God. I even heard it in class this morning, here, and you're to be commended. Um, hell's a good place to start with some people. I mean, you can scare some people into church by talking about hell and how hot it is and how long-term it is. You, you, you can do that, but as long as the fear of hell is there, they'll stay. But when the fear of hell leaves, they do too. The only concept that brings you in long term is the actual full concept of love and grace. And if you want to scare people into the church, it'll work for a while. But until they understand who God is and his care, his concern, his desire to be for you and for them, a loving father, they won't stay long. I, I want to I close with this. What am I asking of you? Here's what I'm asking in this process of smell. I simply argue that the cross be raised again at the center of the marketplace as well as the steeple of the church. I am recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral but between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves, on a town garbage heap, at a crossroad of politics so cosmopolitan that they had to write his title in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek, and at the kind of place where cynics talk smut and thieves curse and soldiers gamble. 
Because there's where he died, and that is what he died about. And there's where Christ's men and women ought to be. That's what the church people ought to be about. God never calls us to be perfect. He never says that you'll never make a mistake. He never says that the only people you have to hang around are the people on Sunday morning at church. What he says is, if you'll accept me, my rule for your life, my will for your life, I will infuse you with something that you cannot get anywhere else. Peace and salvation. And the knowledge knowing that my spirit, he says, living in you will make you people you cannot be by yourself. Brethren, you cannot read the Bible enough. You cannot pray enough. You cannot sing enough songs. Mike cannot preach enough sermons to make you by yourselves what you need to be. But with God coming along and you giving your life to him, and him allowing his spirit to live in you. There is a power in you that will never be defeated if you will allow it to work. Our problem is we're afraid to allow it to work. Personal opinion. The best work I have ever done. Was when God put me in a position when I thought I cannot do this. I didn't start preaching until I was 50 something, none of your business. 52. My dad always told me, if you can stay out of the pulpit, stay out of the pulpit. And I did. Rather well. Always in the background, always working with the church. Never in the pulpit. One day they said, would you? And I thought, could I? Not sure I can yet. But I'm trying the best I can. And I'll tell you what. I have had sermons corrected in the middle of my sermon. Not by something I did, but because of something God did. An idea, a thought. He has changed so many sermons and made them better. I have been in the middle of a sermon where I thought, even I'm bored. I'm, I'm about to go to sleep in my own sermon. You know, and yet something comes along and all of a sudden it becomes the best sermon I've ever preached. I don't know. You can do what God calls you to do. Because he never calls you to do, to do things on your power alone. He calls you to do on his power. And if we're going to say no to him, I don't want to be in the conversation. I want us to be a church. I want you to be a church. I want Mike to be a preacher. Where you step out in faith and allow God's power to do what you by yourselves cannot do. And influence the people of Kaufman to the point that people like Bob Green's grandson will simply say, what is that smell? And you can say very honestly, that's the aroma of Christ. That's the aroma of Christ living in us, through us. Our speech is different. Our actions are different. My life is different. Not because you've just decided to make a difference, but because God said, I'm working through you. Let's do this. I'm going to call you to something, and I'll give you the power to do it. Trust me, we can solve this problem. That's my challenge. What kind of people ought you to be? You are to be the aroma of Christ. Let me ask this question. What's your aroma this morning? Are you doing things on your own power? Are you living the life that you think you deserve based on what you want? Or are you the kind of person who thinks there's something more to life than what you've got? And you've been thinking about it. You've been praying about it. Perhaps people have been talking to you about it. Today may be the time to turn your life over to him and say, 
I'm yours, lock, stock, and barrel. I want to smell like you. Just happened to think of something. Pardon me, I'm going to take one more minute. I used to work with Lynn Anders. He has a book called They Smell Like Sheep, talking about elders. He went to South America one time. He forgot his material. He said, you got to send it to me. i got to preach. I have, a, I have a seminar down here. i got to have that material. So we sent it twice. He said, it's not coming through. So we asked him, what's coming through? What, what's, what's being said down there? He said, two words, they smell. That's what I want you to do. I want you to smell. Smell like your Lord. Follow him. Become like him. If you need baptism this morning, I'm sure the water's ready. I'm sure the clothes are ready. Uh, Ken and, and the group here are ready for that. You would be welcomed. And the challenge for you then would be to become like Christ. Become his aroma of Christ. There, there are other possibilities. I've always heard that on every pew there's a broken heart. On every pew there's a problem. On every pew there's someone asking the question, maybe that's you. You want to know what? The church here will pray for you. They'll welcome you. They'll put their arms around you because they are the aroma of Christ. They want you to be that too. Perhaps that's you. There may be somebody there this morning who wants to place membership here. I hear you're growing. I hope that continues. You want to start plugging in here? You want to find a place to serve? Now's the time. Now's the place. Whatever you need, we ask you to come right now while we stand, while we sing.